Tim. Andrew, I'm afraid this isn't going to be a softball one. Uh, with the idea of not wanting to raise taxes, where and how does the government cut expenses to bring the budget closer into balance? And, and let me first be clear uh, with respect to my position on tax increases. What I think this country needs to do is take a one-year time out and not increase the payroll tax and not increase all the taxes the president wants to increase. We need to do a comprehensive overhaul of the entire tax code to make it simpler, fairer, easier to understand. You know, the United States hasn't reduced its corporate income tax since 1988. We have a corporate income tax rate of 35%. In the past four years, 75 countries around the globe have lowered their corporate income tax rates. That's why companies like Apple are avoiding paying $2.4 billion in taxes to this country by keeping their profits <coughs> overseas. I met with some executives of Oracle the other day, and Oracle is making a lot of money in Europe, and they're not bringing that money back to America because they, they don't want to pay the American corporate tax. So instead of bringing that money back here to America and using it to grow more jobs, to expand their plants, they're taking those profits and keeping them overseas. So it's a lose-lose situation. Now your question was, where are we gonna cut spending? And I'm not someone who will ever tell you it's easy to cut spending, it doesn't hurt, it does hurt, and it's not easy. But it's a lot easier to cut spending now than to keep going on this path that we're on and come to a complete meltdown of our economy. So the Simpson-Bowles Commission had a number of recommendations of areas where we could reduce spending without the world coming to an end. And one of the recommendations that they had was that we reduce the size of the federal workforce through attrition. We don't need to fire anyone who works for the federal government. But what they recommended was that for every three people who retire from the federal government, that we only rehire two people. And if we did that over time, we could save a lot of money. They also said that charity begins at home. And both the Congress and the White House could well afford to trim their staff by 15%. That we could save a considerable amount of money through leading by example. And I've always thought that we ought to be prepared um, to, we ought to be prepared to lead by example in government. And quite frankly, I will tell you tonight that I would be willing to accept a cut in my pay as a member of Congress in order to demonstrate that we're serious about cutting spending. We shouldn't ask others to take a hit unless we're prepared to take a hit ourselves. And if we lead by example, I think that we'll find that we can cut spending. It's not gonna be fun, but it's necessary, and we have to find uh, a willingness to do it. And I think Republicans and Democrats should check their partisan hats for a minute and agree to go into a room, and instead of looking to score political points, recognize that as Americans we have a higher priority and that's to solve the problem. You know, Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan came from very different places politically, but at the end of the day, they recognized that they had to move things along. And so they were willing to compromise in order to advance the national interests, which are the interests that matter most to all of us. <clears throat> Yes, sir. You mentioned that the, uh, the health care system you, you felt was broken. What kind of uh, vision do you have in terms of repairing that system? Well, let me, let me start by um, highlighting those elements of the President's health care bill, which I think are laudable and which ought to be the centerpiece of any reform that we have moving forward. I think it's laudable that the President's health care bill mimics what we already did in Connecticut several years ago, which is to allow young people to stay on their parents' health insurance policies until they turn 26. That's something I supported in Connecticut. I think it's something that makes good sense. The other thing that I think needs to be part of our national policy is prohibiting insurance companies from discriminating against people on the basis of pre-existing conditions. It's a pretty harsh world that doesn't let someone buy insurance when the very thing that they need insurance for won't be covered. And I think fairness and equity 
should dictate that those be the ground rules of any health care reform. I also think that the donut hole, the prescription drug donut hole in Medicare was a fiasco from the time it was passed. Whoever could have thought of that, but they did. And I think that that needs to be fixed. So those are the things that I think need to be the centerpiece of any health care reform. But my fear is the president's health care bill will end up costing way too much and delivering way too little. And I say that because when the bill was passed two years ago, the Congressional Budget Office said that when fully implemented, 20 million American citizens would have no health care coverage whatsoever. Two years later, the Congressional Budget Office now says that it will be 30 million Americans with no health care coverage whatsoever. That, to me, is a solution which we shouldn't be celebrating. But the other thing that we shouldn't be celebrating is the 21 new taxes that are embedded in this bill that are going to increase taxes by $800 billion over the next 10 years. The National Federation of Independent Business has concluded that we're going to lose a minimum of 150,000 small business jobs because of the implementation of this bill. And many corporations, big Fortune 500 companies like AT&T and Caterpillar, are saying, you know what? This may be so expensive for us that we're going to choose to pay the fine rather than to provide the coverage that the bill is going to require us to cover. So I, I think that the better answer would be to direct each of the 50 states to come up with a solution and for the federal government to be a partner in directing the states to come up with a solution. Because the federal government has its hands full today trying to fix Medicare and Social Security. We've handed over two very big programs to the federal government, and they're good programs, but they're both going bankrupt. And to hand over yet a third responsibility, a national health care program to the federal government, I think is um, a dangerous road to go on. Not to mention the fact that it is offensive to me that members of Congress did not read or understand the bill before it was passed. I think we all deserve that better as citizens of this country. So I think if we allow each of the states to take on this challenge, we could learn from the successes and we could learn from the failures. A number of our states are pretty far ahead. I mean, Massachusetts has 98% of its citizens covered. Is it perfect? No. Are they having problems? You bet. But they're trying to solve the problem at the state level. Oregon has been in this business for a long, long time. Is their system perfect? No. Are they working at it? You bet. And I just think that that would be, in the long run, um, more affordable and more workable. But I'm obviously going to deal with whatever the reality is uh, when I get to Washington, D.C. Deirdre. I'm gravely concerned for, it, for the nonprofit sector. Because as we see the unemployment growing and those that are uninsured, we take on a greater load of caring those people, and yet we have great funding issues. And if the government were to have to take on all these folks, I mean, it's just impossible. So I don't know how we can partner better um, with our government as well as local business to serve people in need. And the reality is, that places like Charlotte Hungerford Hospital are not um, in the business of making a profit. They're in the business. They need to keep their doors open, and they need to make payroll. But things like sequestration have potentially devastating consequences for hospitals in Connecticut. Specifically, if the federal government stops funding residents, graduate medical education, our hospitals don't have the room to pick up that I think it's $60 million that's um, at risk if sequestration goes into effect in loss of federal support for graduate medical education. So, you know, the nonprofits are very much caught in um, what's going on in healthcare, particularly um, hospitals, and every other nonprofit uh, knows that when the economy struggles, people are not in a position to be as generous as they'd like to be. And I've always said in Connecticut, you know, when someone leaves Connecticut for Florida, and who of us doesn't know many people that have done that, we lose, not only, then we get no income tax from them, we don't get any death tax, and we also lose people that are 
critically important to the success of our nonprofits. And if they're in Florida, it's hard for them to go to a board meeting of the Girl Scouts of Connecticut. Just for one example. United Way. United Way. Uh, mental health issues. Sure, and I'm, I, yeah. I'm, I'm only <laughs> saying the Girl Scouts because of, <laughs> My dad. of your background and, and the difference you've made in the lives of so many young, young women and girls uh, in this corner of Connecticut. Art. Andrew, I'm on Medicare, and uh, nationally sponsored ads tell me on TV that you're going to raise my Medicare costs. <laughs> Can you explain that? Uh, thank you, Art. <laughs> <laughs> our, our campaign made a critical mistake. We went on TV with a positive ad, <clears throat> introducing myself and telling the voters of the 5th District what I hope to accomplish as a member of Congress. I thought that maybe voters would want a positive ad and would want to get to know me. Well, my opponent's campaign and the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee in Washington weren't going to waste any money with any kind of positive message. Out of the box, they decided that they would misrepresent my views and try to scare seniors uh, with respect to what I have in mind to solve the problems facing Social Security and Medicare. Let me first tell you the ground rules of my solution. The ground rules of my solution are that anyone who is 50 and older, raise your hand, <laughs> <laughs> should know that I don't think we should change the rules or the benefit structure for anyone who's 50 or older, who's either on Social Security or Medicare. People like us have paid into the system for a long time and should rightfully have the peace of mind that we're going to get what we paid for. For people under age 50, they need to know that they deserve the peace of mind, that there's going to be something left for them when they reach retirement. If we do nothing, the Social Security system will be broke in 2037. Now, 2037 sounds like a long way away, and it is a long way away. It's 25 years away. But wait a second. I'm 52 years old. I hope to be here when I'm 77. And I hope that Social Security will help me meet my expenses. So uh, the answer can't be, we're never going to make any changes for anyone. For people under age 50, I think Republicans and Democrats in Washington should field teams, and I volunteer for this team, to go into a room together as Americans and come out with recommendations that they all agree to support. And now this political game of gotcha, that I said at a debate in Simsbury that we should consider the recommendations of the Simpson Bowles Commission. They have a number of recommendations on how to fix Social Security. Well, because I said we should consider those recommendations, that's morphed into a campaign commercial that says I'm going to do all kinds of draconian things to current beneficiaries, which, I, which is a complete distortion of what I was um, trying to convey. And the approach to problem solving that we've had in Washington for the past four years has brought us to no solutions whatsoever. And I'm prepared to go and try to break the ice yes. and um, start a new conversation about how to solve these problems, because they're real and if we don't address them, they're going to eat us alive. So Art, I think you're over 50. Yes. <laughs> and uh, you can sleep soundly, and everybody else over age 50 can sleep soundly, but Andrew Orbeck is committed to protecting the benefits they earn, both with respect to Medicare and Social Security. Thank you. John. Andrew, in the paper this morning, George Will postulated several potential questions for the presidential debates that are upcoming. Yes. One of them had to do with his view that the, some of the real big banks are too big to fail and therefore too big, period. Uh, my question is, I hadn't thought too hard about it before, but would you support or what do you think about unwinding some of the most onerous pr provisions of Dodd-Frank's and imposing some kind of controls on the size and functions of the real big money center banks? Well, I think that the problems that Wall Street got us into 
not so long ago, in 2006.